This video is sponsored by NVIDIA AI. The battles of Buna and Gona were a brutal awakening for the Allied forces, revealing the harsh realities of jungle warfare and the challenges of fighting in one of the most inhospitable environments on Earth. In late 1942, as part of MacArthur's broader strategy to push up the New Guinea coast, the Allies launched their first major ground offensive against entrenched Japanese positions at these two locations. However, what was expected to be a relatively swift victory turned into a months-long quagmire marred by faulty intelligence, poor logistics and terrifyingly unfamiliar terrain. The swamps and dense jungles surrounding Buna and Gona created natural fortifications for the Japanese defenders, who had expertly entrenched themselves in bunkers and defensive positions. Allied air and artillery support, which had been so effective in more open battlefields, was nearly useless here. The thick canopy and murky swamps made it almost impossible to accurately identify targets, and many bombing raids resulted in friendly fire or missed objectives. From the outset, the operation was plagued by poor planning. Allied commanders underestimated both the Japanese defense's strength and the jungle's debilitating effects on their own troops. Tropical diseases such as malaria and dysentery spread rapidly through the ranks, sapping the strength of soldiers who were already exhausted by the heat and humidity. Supplies were difficult to move through the swamps and the Allies were often forced to fight without adequate food, water or ammunition. MacArthur, commanding from Brisbane, grew increasingly frustrated as the offensive ground to a halt. He had envisioned a swift victory that would allow the Allies to press their advantage along the New Guinea coast, but instead his forces were bogged down in a brutal war of attrition. Unable to understand why his men were making so little progress, he concluded that the problem lay with the leadership on the ground. In December 1942, MacArthur sent General Robert Eichelberger to take command of the stalled offensive, replacing Major General Edwin Harding. Eichelberger's task was daunting. The 32nd Infantry Division, which had been leading the assault, was worn down, disheartened, and suffering heavy casualties. Some officers even suggested withdrawing altogether, but Eichelberger refused. He reorganized the command structure and began implementing new tactics to break the deadlock. It became clear that the traditional infantry assaults, which relied heavily on rifles and small arms fire, were ineffective against the Japanese defenses. The turning point came when Eichelberger coordinated the use of artillery and tanks, which proved to be the decisive factor in overcoming the Japanese bunkers. Historian Jeffrey Perrett later remarked, quote, it was not rifles that mattered, it was artillery and tanks. This shift in strategy allowed the Australian 18th Infantry to break through the Japanese lines using light tanks, which could maneuver through the narrow jungle paths and swamps. The tanks formed wedges that allowed the infantry to follow behind, clearing out Japanese positions that had held firm for months. Despite the tactical innovations, the cost of victory was high. Over 4,000 Allied soldiers were lost during the Buna and Gona campaigns, with the majority of casualties coming from the Australian forces. The terrain itself was as much an enemy as the Japanese, with insect-infested swamps and oppressive heat making each step forward a gruelling ordeal. It was a battle of endurance and the slow, brutal progress took its toll on morale. By January 1943, the Japanese had been driven from their positions and the Allies finally captured Buna and Gona. The importance of coordinated air and ground assaults, the necessity of armor in jungle warfare, and the need for better logistical planning were all hard-earned lessons that would shape future operations throughout the Pacific. 
A new force has emerged in the battle to create better AI videos. In Video AI V3, this impressive update is your intelligence officer, your war correspondent, your combat camera operator, and your strategic planner, all consolidated into one formidable unit. NVIDIA AI V3 doesn't just provide you with a single-shot weapon, it's an entire content creation arsenal rolled into one, the only tool you'll need. Better yet, it's not just about editing existing footage, it's about generating entire videos from scratch that are instantly ready to be shared with your legions of followers. Ready to see this game-changing tool in action? We deployed InVideo AI V3 on a critical mission to produce some B-roll style footage of the Big Sur. In just a few minutes, this is what it delivered. A medal-worthy performance, wouldn't you agree? If you don't like something, just use an edit command like, use my voice. And that's not all it can do. Whatever type of content you have in mind, from relaxation videos to commercials, InVideo AI V3 is the hero you can always rely on, your most loyal ally. Just sit back and watch while InVideo AI V3 brings your ideas to life with sniper-like precision. It's a guaranteed victory. The good news from the front line is that, unlike many other AI video tools which have so far failed to materialize, InVideo AI V3 is going to be ready for action in just a few weeks. If you haven't deployed it yet, now's the time to mobilize. Follow the link in the description to try the current version for free and join our ranks. Better yet, with paid plans starting at just $20 per month, you can use our code WW250 to receive double the video creation minutes for your first month. Don't miss out on this major tactical advantage. Launch your content creation offensive with InVideo AI today. In 1943, Rabol loomed large in the Allied Command's nightmares. It was a Japanese fortress at the northern end of the Solomon Chain that dominated the sea lanes of the Southwest Pacific. Its defenses were considerable. The base housed over 100,000 troops, an arsenal of fighters and bombers, and a decisive naval force. It was the key to Japan's grip on the region. From this bastion, Japanese troops could strike out with devastating air and naval attacks, making any Allied advance toward the Philippines fraught with peril. For General Douglas MacArthur, who had famously vowed, quote, I shall return. Rabul represented the greatest obstacle standing between him and his redemption in the Philippine Islands. The strategic challenge of Rabaul was monumental. Allied intelligence reports revealed that the base was nearly impregnable, its defenses interwoven into the island's natural fortifications. Rabaul's airfields provided a launch pad for Japanese bombers to harass any incoming naval force, while the maritime strength housed there ensured that the base could resupply and reinforce other Japanese positions across the region. As the summer of 1943 unfolded, the combined chiefs of staff, the top military planners of the United States and Britain, devised a plan to neutralize this fortress. Operation Cartwheel was born. The plan called for a two-pronged Allied advance to encircle and strangle Rabaul from east and west. To the west, MacArthur's forces would push up the coast of New Guinea, seizing key islands and airfields along the way. To the east, Admiral William F. Halsey would lead the advance along the Solomon Islands, his forces leapfrogging from one island to the next, driving toward the same objective, the isolation of Rabaul. The strategic vision was ambitious, but not without controversy. MacArthur, known for his determination and confidence, resisted the notion of bypassing Rabaul. His arguments were clear and forceful. Rabaul, he argued, was too dangerous to be left in the rear. The base's excellent harbour and airfields could support any future westward advance. 
MacArthur believed that his forces would remain vulnerable without direct control of Rabaul. MacArthur's plan was straightforward. Capture Rabaul, neutralize its air and naval capabilities, and clear the path to the Philippines. However, the combined chiefs saw a different path. After careful consideration, they concluded that the cost of a direct assault on Rabaul, likely to result in thousands of Allied casualties, was too high. Instead, they proposed isolating the stronghold through a combination of airstrikes and naval blockades, rendering it ineffective without engaging in a bloody, drawn-out siege. This decision marked a pivotal moment in the Pacific campaign. By bypassing Rabul, the Allies would focus their efforts on establishing a network of airfields and bases that would strangle the Japanese forces inside. The airfields captured in New Guinea and the Solomons would allow Allied bombers to pound Rabul from a distance, neutralizing its effectiveness without the need for a costly ground assault. The combined chief's decision to bypass the base was a calculated gamble that would test the resilience and ingenuity of MacArthur and Halsey's forces. Though initially resistant to the idea, MacArthur soon found himself navigating a complex web of strategic compromises. The fate of the Pacific campaign and MacArthur's promise to return to the Philippines hung in the balance. As Operation Cartwheel unfolded, it became clear that air superiority was the key to breaking Japan's grip on the Pacific. For General Douglas MacArthur, airfields were not just tactical objectives, but the linchpins of his entire strategy. He declared, quote, Victory depends on the advancement of the bomber line. As Allied forces leapfrogged from one island to the next, seizing airfields, they extended the reach of their bombers deeper into enemy territory. In late February 1943, the Japanese High Command prepared to reinforce their garrison at Ley with a large convoy of eight destroyers and eight troop transports. Carrying over 6,900 men and critical supplies, this convoy was vital to maintaining Japan's hold on New Guinea, but it would never reach its destination. Allied intelligence intercepted Japanese communications and Whitehead's bombers were ready. On March 2nd, 1943, the convoy was spotted near Cape Gloucester and the 5th Air Force launched one of the most innovative and devastating air assaults of the Pacific War. Using a new technique known as skip bombing, where bombs were dropped at low altitudes to bounce across the water into their targets, Allied B-25 Mitchell bombers attacked with lethal precision. This technique allowed bombers to hit ships directly, bypassing the anti-aircraft fire that typically defended Japanese convoys. Flying just above the ocean surface, Allied planes weaved between enemy fire, skipping their bombs into the sides of the Japanese vessels. The results were catastrophic for the Japanese. In just three days of relentless air assaults, the convoy was obliterated. The Battle of the Bismarck Sea was a decisive victory for the Allies. Eight Japanese troop transports and four destroyers were sunk, sending more than 3,000 Japanese troops to a watery grave. The scale of the loss was staggering, but the implications were even greater. The destruction of the convoy ensured that Lei, a critical Japanese garrison in New Guinea, would remain isolated and vulnerable. The Japanese High Command, alarmed by the ferocity and effectiveness of the Allied air assault, decided no more large ships would be sent to reinforce garrisons in New Guinea. The devastation did not end there. Allied bombers continued their campaign of destruction, targeting Japanese airfields and supply depots across the region. In a single raid on Wewak, 
more than 200 Japanese aircraft were destroyed, crippling Japan's ability to launch air offensives in New Guinea. During the cartwheel operation, the airstrips captured by Allied ground forces became crucial in maintaining this relentless pressure, allowing Whitehead's bombers to operate closer to enemy lines and extend their reach deeper into Japanese-held territory. Not only did the Battle of the Bismarck Sea showcase the growing dominance of Allied air power, but it also revealed the increasing vulnerability of Japan's supply lines. With their convoys destroyed and their airfields bombed into submission, the Japanese garrisons in New Guinea found themselves isolated, running low on supplies and reinforcements. The battle underscored the importance of controlling the skies and served as a blueprint for future Allied operations across the Pacific. The next phase of Operation Cartwheel would hinge on the Allies' ability to coordinate amphibious landings and ground assaults in the dense, treacherous jungles of New Guinea. On September 22, 1943, the battle for Finschafen began with one of the most critical amphibious assaults of Operation Cartwheel. Located on the northeastern tip of New Guinea, Finschafen was vital for controlling the sea lanes between New Guinea and New Britain, making it a key strategic target. But even before the first landing craft hit the beach, the campaign was embroiled in controversy. General Douglas MacArthur and Sir Thomas Blamey, the commander of Australian forces, clashed over the size of the force required to capture the Japanese stronghold. Blamey, wary of Japanese defences, insisted that two brigades were necessary for the assault. Confident in his air superiority and naval support, MacArthur believed that one brigade would suffice. This disagreement nearly cost the Allies dearly. When the 9th Australian Division hit the beaches, they encountered far fiercer resistance than expected. Japanese forces, entrenched in well-fortified positions, poured heavy fire onto the landing craft, turning the first wave into a bloodbath. The initial plan, which assumed the Japanese were in limited numbers, was quickly thrown into chaos. The reality was that the Japanese had reinforced Finschafen, and their determination to hold the area caught the Allies off guard. Amphibious operations were a cornerstone of MacArthur's strategy in the Pacific, but they were fraught with difficulties. The beaches at Finschafen were unfamiliar, narrow, and bordered by dense jungle. Landing craft had to maneuver through dangerous waters, and troops faced heavy opposition the moment they set foot ashore. At the helm of the 7th Amphibious Force, Rear Admiral Daniel Barbie was responsible for orchestrating the complex landing operations. Barbie's fleet of landing craft had to hit the beaches before daylight to give the troops time to dig in and prepare for counter-attacks. However, the logistical challenges were immense. The tides, unfamiliar terrain and heavy enemy fire meant that landing craft often ran aground or were forced to divert from their intended landing zones. Despite these obstacles, Barbie managed to get the bulk of the force ashore, supported by naval bombardments from destroyers and cruisers offshore. However, as Barbie later reflected, naval firepower had limitations in jungle warfare. He observed, quote, Naval bombardment is very effective against fixed targets, but of little use when firing into a matted rainforest. The Japanese had dug in deep, using the thick jungle to shield their positions from the barrage. The terrain was so dense that it limited visibility and movement, making it nearly impossible for naval gunfire to dislodge the defenders. The 9th Australian Division pushed forward despite the fierce resistance, relying on close air support and artillery to break through the Japanese defences. The battle for Finschafen became a contest of endurance, with the Allies slowly grinding their way through the jungle, clearing out bunkers and entrenched positions one by one. 
Reinforcements were brought in after it became clear that MacArthur's initial assessment of the required force had underestimated the enemy's strength. Blamey's insistence on a larger force proved to be a wise decision, as the Japanese mounted a series of determined counterattacks that would have overwhelmed a smaller contingent. Throughout the two-week battle, the Allies secured Fienschafen, but at great cost. The dense jungle and the Japanese use of natural terrain defences made every yard a struggle. However, the amphibious landing, despite its challenges, proved critical in gaining a foothold from which the Allies could control the Vitiaz Strait and continue their advance up the New Guinea coast. The success at Finschaffen was a testament to the growing expertise of the Allies in amphibious operations. By this stage in the war, MacArthur's forces, supported by Halsey's 250,000 troops spread across the broader Operation Cartwheel campaign, had become adept at coordinating land, sea and air forces. These hard-learned lessons in logistics, amphibious landings and jungle warfare would soon be put to the test again as the campaign shifted toward Bougainville, the next great target on the road to Rabaul. The Battle for Bougainville, launched in November 1943, marked a critical turning point in Operation Cartwheel. For Admiral William F. Halsey, now a seasoned veteran of amphibious operations, Bougainville presented both a challenge and an opportunity. The island, nestled in the northern Solomons, was heavily fortified by the Japanese, with more than 60,000 troops scattered across key defensive positions. However, Halsey opted for a bold, strategic gamble instead of engaging these entrenched forces head-on. It was a decision that would prove decisive in the broader Pacific campaign. On November 1, 1943, over 34,000 Allied troops from the Fein Marine Amphibious Corps stormed the beaches of Empress Augusta Bay. Despite Japanese expectations of a frontal assault on their stronger southern positions, Halsey's landing caught them off guard. The dense jungle and rugged terrain initially shielded the Japanese from Allied bombardments, but the element of surprise worked in the Allies' favor. As historian John A. Lorelli commented, quote, the Japanese believed they faced a stronger force than had actually landed. While the initial landings met with only moderate resistance, the terrain quickly became a ruthless adversary. Bougainville's thick jungles and swampy conditions were reminiscent of earlier battles in the Solomons and New Guinea. Visibility was limited, and the dense foliage made it difficult for artillery and air support to deliver effective strikes. The Japanese, although surprised by the landings, soon regrouped and launched fierce counterattacks, determined to push the Allies back into the sea. The battle for control of Hill 700 became one of the most intense and decisive moments in the Bougainville campaign. The hill was a key defensive position for the Allies, providing a clear vantage point over the surrounding area, including the newly established airstrip, which was critical to supporting future operations. On March 8, 1944, Japanese forces launched a massive assault on Hill 700, briefly breaking through American lines. Close quarters combat ensued as the Americans fought to hold their ground. At times, the fighting devolved into brutal hand-to-hand -hand encounters, with both sides sustaining heavy casualties. However, the Americans had learned hard lessons from previous campaigns. Their experience in jungle warfare, particularly the importance of combined arms tactics, proved invaluable. Reinforcements were quickly deployed and artillery support was called in to pound the Japanese attackers. After several days of fierce fighting, the Japanese assault was repulsed and Hill 700 remained in Allied hands. The failure of this counter-attack marked the beginning of the end for Japanese resistance on Bougainville. 
While the ground battle raged, the Allies also faced challenges at sea and in the air. Japanese naval forces launched several attempts to dislodge the Allied beachhead, but Halsey's naval forces, supported by land-based bombers, thwarted these efforts. More than 17 Japanese planes were lost in the ensuing naval battles, further weakening Japan's ability to defend its Pacific holdings. By maintaining control of the seas, Halsey ensured that the Allies could continue to reinforce their positions on Bougainville, securing their foothold on the island. The battle for Bougainville was not just a tactical victory, it was a strategic triumph that crippled Japanese operations in the region. With the capture of key airstrips on Bougainville, Allied bombers could now strike at the heart of Japan's defensive perimeter. Rabul was now within reach. The lessons learned in earlier campaigns, from amphibious landings to jungle combat, paid off, allowing the Allies to achieve their objectives with fewer casualties than in earlier operations. As Bougainville fell under Allied control, the noose around Rabaul tightened. The once impenetrable Japanese stronghold was now effectively isolated, its garrison cut off from reinforcements and resupply. The success of the Bougainville campaign signaled the completion of Operation Cartwheel and the beginning of the end for Japan's hold in the Pacific. World War II on TV extends its highest commendations to NVIDIA AI for their support of this transmission. Remember, NVIDIA AI V3 is launching soon to be your most valuable asset in the content creation theater. Check out the link in the description below to get your hands on this game-changing technology with paid plans starting at just $20 per month. And don't forget to use our code WW250 to double the video creation minutes in your first month.